Now it's time for today's perspective on the programme and welcome to a new reality. Your reality, a turning point where a changing climate is no longer an abstract threat. It's upon us. We feel it. We see it. Those are the words of my guest on the programme today as he goes about the business of spreading the realities of climate change. Now, he's been listed as one of the world's most 100 most influential people in climate policy, spending years now analysing global environmental politics and climate policies with a special focus on the Middle East. Now, he's based in uh, Doha, usually. Nishad Shafi has advised and negotiated in many world climate summits, and he's uh, founder of the Arab Youth Climate Movement in Qatar. All sorts of other things he's involved in as well, but too long to list all of them. Uh, Nisha Shafi joins us uh, now, in fact, from Milan. We'll explain why you're in Milan in just a moment. But first of all, let's talk a bit about um, home and Doha, Qatar. I mean, your neighbour, Saudi Arabia as well. And thinking of those countries, I inevitably think of oil. I mean, how difficult is it to spread a, a climate message in those countries? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Well, uh, to start with uh, the region as such, uh, it is um, um, a difficult transition, but of course a necessary transition. And the countries in the region, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, has been leading in the forefront uh, towards diversification of their current economy from, uh, from oil and gas or fossil fuel industries towards um, uh, tourism and attracting more uh, international events. So that is the uh, ideal case or having um, uh, Expo 2020 in UAE and uh, the upcoming FIFA World Cup in Qatar are all uh, ways and attributions towards changing that course of getting alternate revenues and changing the course of how they want to decarbonize and move towards uh, uh, energy transition that could be ideal both from economic perspective and also for the growth of their country. And do you really think that's the case, that people are really shifted and, and changed their minds and their way of thinking uh, in, in, in more favourably towards the climate? Well, absolutely. I mean, the work of Arab Climate Movement is to do that from the com community perspective. Of course, government has its own obligation as a part of the Paris Agreement uh, and enhancing their NDCs. That's from the international agreement with the UN. But we as a young people and our organization, we are looking from a community perspective where how we can change that uh, community thinking on this uh, this idea of transition, uh, looking after climate is uh, our friend, making sure our future are secure for all of us. And what specifics um, are you talking about here? And are the issues the same in the Middle East as they are elsewhere in the world? I mean, over here, obviously, it's to do with reducing uh, coal power stations, for example, putting up more uh, wind turbines, uh, solar panels, that kind of thing. I mean, the issue is the same. Well, the issue would be seemingly same, but the impacts of climate are far severe than what you feel in the European countries. Uh, if it is two degrees Celsius increase, it would bring catastrophic impacts towards the, around the world. That would be amplified in our region as, as the uh, latest of the IPCC reports and the, uh, the future, uh, the, uh, the past reports do say, given at the pace of current temperature raise, uh, Middle East would be inhabitable in, in two decades or three decades' time. That is making us not to live in the region. We may migrate. That brings of uh, climate migrant or climate refugees in the coming uh, days, not the war in the region, which is known for refugees. So the ideal scenario is for the regional leaders to work in cooperation to implement, uh, you know, moving towards uh, energy transition through solar or if we do wind power. So ideally, transition is an ideal way for them. It is both economical and benefit for the region and their respective countries. And you mentioned specifically young people earlier on. I mean, it's, it's predominantly with the youth that you're trying to work with, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. As a part of our Arabic Climate Movement initiative is to work amongst young people to bring up that policy change, build up their communities, awareness about climate issues and what is at stake. Sometimes, given in the luxury of life, people forget that there are, there are issues that you don't see on our day-to-day -day life, but that's happening at a very fast rate, unlike any other part of the world. So that is absolutely how AYCM or Arab Youth Climate Movement Qatar works in, to, to, to bring up that community voices, telling that, yes, we feel the, uh, the problem. We want to be part of not only the talks, but also part of the solution as such. Yeah, and that's uh, the point where we need to explain why you're in Milan, because you're actually there, aren't you, for the uh, Youth for Climate Driving Ambition Summit representing uh, Qatar. Tell us what that summit's all about. Well, uh, we arrived here for the Youth for Climate Summit, uh, uh, which is uh, co-organised by the Italian government. 
and the UK government, who is jointly hosting the COP26 back in, uh, in next month in, in Glasgow in November. Uh, the, the ambitions are high. Young people are coming after uh, meeting up after uh, many years of time. Since COVID, this is the first of that kind of physical meeting. Obviously, uh, the, the youth are looking for, for a, a sort of a document or a statement coming out. Uh, we're working on four thematics here. And the idea is to present to the president of uh, Italy upon the completion of the third day. The, the idea is to bring the voices from every every part or every corner of the world to tell their leaders, and not only local leaders, but also the regional leaders and powers, that young voices cannot be ignored anymore and the ambitious climate action has to be taken without any delay and also work with the most vulnerable countries, the countries which who are impacts to climate change are far, far severe than what we feel in our respective countries. Are you optimistic, though, for COP26? I mean, there's been a, an awful lot of talk beforehand, isn't there, that, yes, it's going to be a, a fundamental shift of, of change of policy, but at the same time, it's not going to be enough, is it? Well, I mean, uh, this has been uh, this is the talk that happens uh, ahead of all the cops. I mean, we've always been optimistic for the cops, and cops are still running on. And uh, given the fact this year has a lot of lobbying by the UK government, they're seemingly working at some times like a, a lobbying the uh, the the COP person Alok Sharma was here in the Middle East uh, uh, campaigning, camping in Qatar, camping in UAE, Saudi Arabia, and even he was lately in China and India. So it looks like a, a sort of a diplomatic win for UK doing that. But how much ambitious that want to come out, only time would say. But I am a person of uh, optimism. Um, I see as an optimistic person. There can be some challenges if you are not having a collective voices given the COVID uh, restriction and many of the civil society organizations are not able to participate, would be a challenge of not being heard at this uh, crucial summit. So if you want to have an ideal and successful one, every aspect of the society, the, the civil society and the youth all has to be heard at the same time, else it would be just another cop. And how difficult is it, do you think, to spread the message as well beyond young people? I mean, we've been hearing a, a, a lot over the last few months about how young people are actually pretty convinced by the, the, the problems of climate change and, and the need to change. But it's also persuading middle-aged people and particularly older people as well, who've perhaps, you know, not uh, quite so worried about climate change, that they've got to really change their habits too. Definitely. I mean, that thing is happening, like you mentioned in the beginning. The impacts of climate change is nothing uh, for unforeseeable future. It is the current future, or current happening things. And quite uh, probably young people, not only young people, like you mentioned, uh, young adults, and adults and our parents are feeling the pressure now. Unlike in the past, we say, hey, this current change in temperature would be something my generation would feel in 10 years' time. No, they are feeling it. They understand the, uh, the same issue would be impacting them in the current phase. Uh, and also at the same time, and you see that the discussions in the dinner tables with the parents, I would say that th this is changing. They do ask, why, why are you advocating for? Why are you advocating for policy change? Why are you working with the uh, young groups? Ideally, now the discussion is not just our future, but also future of them at the moment, because the phase of change is happening in such a fast phase. If you don't have a current policies goes in a faster phase, I think it will be difficult to manage. Great to hear that optimism on the programme this morning. Thanks very much for talking to us. That's uh, Nisha Chaffee joining us there uh, from Milan. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye.